This video is a visualisation of a proposed continuum of tendon pathology by Cook and Purdom, published in 2009. We'll review this and then look at the reflections and updates that Cook et al. had seven years on. A simple view of a tendon is that it attaches muscle to bone and allows movement of a joint. However, there is more to their role and each tendon is different due to varying functional requirements. They each have an ability to absorb and release energy like a spring and to be stiff with standing loading. These attributes allow efficient movement such as running and jumping. When a tendon is loaded appropriately, it adapts and becomes stiffer and more resilient, but does not become thicker, i.e. the tendon structure is improved rather than increasing the size of the structure. It is also possible to relatively underload a tendon when returning from injury or with athletes acute training loads reducing too much relative to their chronic loads. Cross-reference this with the work of Tim Gabbett. In these cases, the unloaded tendon becomes stress shielded, whereby the superficial portion of the tendon bears too much load and the deep portion too little. The stress shielded tendon under even normal or excessive loads, plus or minus other factors such as bone spurs, diabetes, statin use, etc., can become reactive. In the same way, a normal tendon, when subjected to excessive load, can become reactive. The reactive tendon will try and thicken to try and control the load by increasing the number of cells and matrix in the affected portion of the tendon. Although we have stages of tendinopathy, they are not absolute, and here are presented as a continuum. If the load continues to be excessive, we then move along the continuum to a tendon in disrepair. Here the tendon continues to try and thicken to protect itself, but as this occurs we start to see separation of collagen fibres and disorganisation of the cell Since matrix. Since the continuum was first proposed we also in see new blood and vessels and nerves been which may account for some of the ongoing further considered. The reactive tendon, or that in and we know more about can move back along the whole. continuum towards as normalcy such, if it's loading is modified paper and revisiting and discussing However, the model. if this does not occur, the tendon can become degenerative. Here we start to see cell death in the affected portion of the tendon. However, rehab can still target the unaffected part of the tendon, so all is not lost. Since the continuum was first proposed in 2009, it has been used in research, has further been considered, and we know more about tendons. As such, Cook et al. published a paper revisiting and discussing the model. In this, they emphasise the donut hole analogy first suggested by Docking in 2014. This is the idea that while we have a continuum of tendinopathy, not all of the tendon is going to be in the same state at the same time. While we may have a small degenerative hole that has a lost capacity to transfer load, the rest of the tendon will be in varying states along the continuum. In this update, they coined the term reactive on degenerative tendinopathy to emphasize the fact that the state of the tendon is fluid. The non-degenerative normal tendon drifts in and out of a reactive response. I think we see this happening in rehab and sport as you're challenging the envelope of capacity of the tendon. Stay too far inside the envelope of capacity and we do not see positive change in tendon stiffness. But if we stress it too much, we can drift into a reactive response, which if not recognised and addressed, risks us moving towards further degenerative change. The update further discusses pain mechanisms in tendons. First, they highlight two presentations of pain. One, a reactive tendon with a first presentation of tendon pain following acute overload. Two, a reactive on late disrepair or reactive on degenerative tendon pathology. Both of these suggest a nociceptive driver of pain, but the mechanism is still unknown. Theoretically, either of the two presentations may increase expression of nociceptive substances and their receptors, which in turn increases stimulation of the peripheral nerve and is interpreted as pain. So when we see studies showing tendons with abnormal imaging but no pain, it suggests that for some reason a nociceptive threshold has not been reached or some sensory modulation has occurred centrally. Cook et al. do not go into more detail on the modulation of the central nervous system 
as this is well described by others. I would suggest looking at the recent paper by Woolwork, Bell and Cately and Mosley in BJSM in 2015, which discusses the idea of a cortical body matrix or a network of neurotags which interact to regulate, control and protect the body. The takeaway point is that tendon pain should be considered to be a combination of nociceptive and centrally driven phenomena. The update closes with some suggestion on how to take the continuum to guide treatment. They highlight the lack of long-term relief from many of the common pain-relieving interventions such as NSAIDs, steroid injections, high-volume injection and surgical scraping. They also note that interventions solely targeting pain typically allow for recurrence of pain. Instead, they highlight the pain-relieving properties of isometric contractions and a loading program. Although we have growing evidence with respect to pain relief, we still have limited evidence looking at how this approach affects function and if there is a better way to move forward. They finally discuss if there is a particular way we should treat based on the structure of the tendon as described within the continuum. They emphasise that since their original continuum paper, it's clearer that the degenerative portion has no capacity to change. Additionally, they note evidence showing the remaining tendon can compensate for the areas of loss by increasing their cross-sectional area to have the needed capacity. So the tendinopathy continuum model is helpful, but their phrase of treating the donut, not the whole, is a very important closing statement. Now I created this visualization as a way to help me digest the science, so I hope it's helpful to you as well. As a clinician working primarily with athletes, many of whom are tendon patients, I'm thankful for the work these researchers do. Their continued progress in understanding tendon pain and function helps us provide more effective treatment to our clients.